brilliant, he was insightful, extremely creative, and driven, focused. He was a stepping stone. His work allowed others to build on it so that we now have a better understanding of atomic structure and uh, the internal workings of an atom, uh, which consequently leads to atomic power, which is what the world is looking for, a cheap power source, and atomic energy is it. Um, if we can just find a way to do it safely. Niels Henrik David Bohr was a revolutionary scientist in the world of quantum physics. He saved many Jewish lives as well. As the Nazis took over Germany, he made Copenhagen, Denmark a refuge center for Jewish scientists. He later helped the United States by splitting molecules to construct the atomic bomb, but shortly after realizing the dangers and harmful effects it had on humans, he led protests and debated for the peaceful usage of atomic energy. Bohr also revised the Rutherford model of the atom and formed a more accurate model, the Bohr model, one of the most famous symbols for quantum physics. Niels Bohr, the master of quantum physics. Niels Bohr was born on October 17, 1885 in Copenhagen, Denmark to Christian Bohr and Ellen Adler. He had two siblings, Jenny and Harold Bohr. Harold was born three years after Bohr and became his inseparable friend. Their father, Christian Bohr, influenced both of his sons greatly because he let them listen to debates between him and his fellow colleagues. Bohr attended Gamble Home School, which he went to starting from first grade until university. He wasn't exactly the brightest of the students, but he excelled in his favorite subjects, physics and math. Niels Bohr started going to Copenhagen University in 1903. One of the most influential classes was Professor Hofting's philosophy class. Hofting was a close friend to Bohr's dad, so he let Bohr and his brother listen to a few debates and even get involved in them, which influenced his work in physics greatly. Bohr preferred conversation to working alone, and he felt most productive when he had established a connection and a comfortable environment. In Copenhagen University, the textbooks failed to keep up with Bohr's academic level, so he started reading scientific journals. During his undergraduate career, he did many projects, including an award-winning surface tension project. Eventually, his father had to force him to write down his findings. Those findings won him a gold medal in academics, which was later put into a distinguished English journal. Later, he had modified and expanded on the findings and theories of Riley, a very famous scientist in the world of physics at that time. Bohr finally finished his doctorate in 1911 for his work in electron theory of metals. Niels Bohr's leadership and legacy influenced and is still influencing our lives greatly. Shortly after receiving his doctorate's degree, Bohr traveled to England to work at Manchester University with the most foremost quantum physicist of all time, including Ernest Rutherford. Ernest Rutherford had recently suggested the atom had a miniature dense nucleus surrounded by a cloud of nearly weightless electrons with random orbits. There were a few problems with the model, however. For example, according to Max Planck, an extremely successful physicist, the electrons orbiting the nucleus should lose energy until they spiral down into the center, collapsing the atom. Bohr revised Rutherford's model of the atom by adding in Planck's new idea, proposing his own model of the atom, the Bohr model. That way, electrons existed at set levels of energy at fixed distances from the nucleus. His model was a huge leap forward in making the theory fit the experimental evidence that other physicists have found over the years. A few inaccuracies remained to be found by others over the next few years, but his main idea was proved to be correct. The Bohr model is a brilliant deduction and synthesis of the information that we knew about the atom at that time. He was influenced by um, his colleagues. They were first professors and then they were colleagues. Um, 
J.J. Thompson and Ernest Rutherford to um, present a 2D model of a 3D phenomena, and it does very well for that. Now, we know now that that's, there are better ways to represent it and there's more things that go on, but for his time, it was a very easy way for, especially for students to understand what the inside of an atom was like. In 1922, at age 37, he received the Nobel Peace Prize for this work. After Hitler overtook Germany, Bohr was deeply concerned for his Jewish colleagues there and provided a place for them to live and work without having to be afraid of the Nazis. Bohr's personal warmth, humor, and hospitality made Copenhagen a refuge for the greatest physicist of the century. He donated his Nobel Peace Prize over to the Finnish war effort. He later traveled to the United States to help scientists to split the molecule, which led the United States to launch the Manhattan Project to develop the atomic bomb. During his absence, Hitler had already taken over Denmark. Although Bohr wasn't Jewish, his mother was, and because of that, the Nazis were trying to hunt him down. Three years later, Bohr and his family fled to Sweden to avoid being captured. He and his son, Ayaj Bohr, traveled back to the U.S. to help work on the Manhattan Project. There, Bohr met one of the most famous scientists of all time, Albert Einstein. He and Einstein had learned so much from their discussions and became great friends. God does not play dice with the universe, Einstein once said, meaning that supernatural beings do not gamble with science. Bohr had replied, Einstein, stop telling God what to do. Bohr soon noticed that the atomic bomb could cause some serious damage to people, so after the World War II, Bohr started to lead protests and debates to promote atomic energy in a more useful and peaceful way. After years of protesting and debating, he succeeded in having the U.S. decrease the amount of nuclear weapons. Bohr was a theoretician. He had a passion for solving theoretic problems. He didn't even consider what its use could be in the practical world until he was made aware of it. As the mythos says, whether it's true or not, we don't know, that he was sent a message through the French underground and immediately put into place plans to be rescued and moved to the United States. I would suspect that part of the underlying uh, conditions for him to come to the United States were that he help us. After the war, Niels Bohr returned to Europe and continued to call for peaceful applications of atomic energy. In his open letter to the United Nations, dated June 9, 1950, Bohr envisioned an open world mode of existence between countries that abandoned isolationism. He continued to be active in government, mainly known as the president of the Royal Danish Society all the way until his death. He spoke out for the peaceful usage of nuclear energy, influencing the creation of the International Atomic Energy Agency, which helped limit the power of nuclear energy. He helped put together the Atoms for Peace Conference of 1955. In 1957, Bohr received the Atoms for Peace Award for his trailblazing theories and efforts to use atomic energy responsibly. Bohr was a prolific writer with more than 100 publications to his name. Niels Henrik David Bohr died of a heart attack in Copenhagen on November 18, 1962, at the age of 77 honorably. Bohr is still influencing us today, from the Bohr model of the atom to his help to the Manhattan Project. He left materials and documented what he did in such a way that others could build on it, so that it became a stepping stone for our understanding. Uh, he also left a legacy that scientists need to be careful of, which is if you're doing something in a the of a theoretical nature, you need to look pay attention to what else it might be useful for or why somebody is choosing to fund your research to make sure that it is for the betterment of mankind and not for the detriment.